In this little mini unit, I'd like to show you how to use the latest version of Firebug. When we start writing JavaScript, there's really no good way, at least with the tools that we're using, all the open source tools, to debug your JavaScript. If you make any errors, you have any syntax errors, most of the browsers like Explorer and Firefox will show you if there's an error in your JavaScript, but they will show them to you one at a time. The Firebug tool allows you to see more than one error in many circumstances and clean them all up at once. But what it's more valuable for is debugging logic errors. Firebug allows you to put in debug statements. It allows you to put in breakpoints. It allows you to view your variables as the program is running and try to sort out what's wrong with your program. So I'd like to show you that. Before we start, I also want to show you that Firebug has the ability to actually analyze HTML and CSS. So you can look at somebody else's page or your own page and experiment a little bit, try to find out what's, uh, what causes certain things to happen. So we'll look at that. Before we do, let's take a quick look at how to get Firebug installed. It's already installed on this version of Firefox, but if you haven't installed it yet, simply drop down the Fire, Firefox list, and this is Firefox, I believe it's 7, 7.1. I guess we can take a quick look here um, under help. That's not what I wanted to do. This is version 7. Right, so if your Firefox looks a little different, it could be you're working with the latest and greatest and reviewing this after the recording was made. Well, this is Firefox 7, so what you need to do is find the add-on somehow in your version of Firefox. When you click on add-ons, right now it's loading the ones I already have, you can search for Firebug. Press enter, and it'll go out and find Firebug. And mine's already installed, so it's not listed, but normally you'll see Firebug listed here, and then you can install it and Firebug will be ready to go. You probably will have to restart Firefox to get the Firebug component to fire to work properly, but once it's there, you'll see the little Firebug in the upper left-hand corner. Again, if you're using an older version of Firefox or if you're using an older version of Firebug, it may appear in the lower right-hand corner, but the latest, greatest version appears up here. So this is the Firebug. Firebug comes, first of all, with a panel. It's initially hidden. Notice right now this is grayed out, so there is no Firebug panel. So the first thing I want to do is turn on the Firebug panel. You just do that by clicking on the bug. And the Firebug console panel comes up. Notice that the panel has lots of different tabs. And each of these tabs can be either enabled or disabled. Notice these are disabled. To simplify things, I recommend that you simply enable all the panels. So I right-click the little drop-down arrow next to the Firebug up here, and I can enable all the panels in one place. Alternatively, you can drop these down and enable them individually, but I think it's just as easy to turn them on, all on. Okay, and then I get a warning saying that when you loaded this page, the panel was disabled, so you might want to refresh it. So I'm going to refresh the page. And I can see that there's no JavaScript on this page, there's no console messages. But as I mentioned before, one of the less commonly used features of Firebug is the ability to actually analyze some HTML. So this is my web page, and even though you don't have access to the source, of course you could right click and view the source, you can ask Firebug to show it to you. So down here we now see the source and as I touch things notice it highlights them. I'm touching the body, it highlights them up there. I can expand this which is very nice. And then I can touch the container tag and see that. I can touch this div style up here that has my title bar across the top. I can maximize this so my page looks a little more normal. There we go, Volker Gall's website up here. And if you wanted to see how some of this stuff was created or maybe you wanted to find out what color that was, can as, actually use this HTML to find that out. can look at it, but if I don't know where it is in the HTML, maybe it's hidden in there someplace, you can use this little uh, object inspector. If you turn on the object inspector, now the reverse happens. As you touch things, they get highlighted in the HTML down below. So I can touch the flag, I can touch the butterfly, I can touch this up here, and the appropriate HTML is highlighted. 
I'm going to click on that to kind of make it, give it the focus. And then notice as you touch things over here, the this is the CSS styles over here show you for the object that you currently have selected, that div across the top, what styles are appropriate for it. So there's an element style, that means it's built in. So it's an inline style, we can see the color and we can see the height and it's reflected over here as well. But it also shows you the styles that are inherited. The body of this page has its own style, so that color of black, the text color, is applied to this. The font size at 100% is applied to this. The font selection, etc. All that stuff is applied to this style. If they are not overridden, then it's applied to this style. So I can touch anything. I can touch this thing over here. Let's go back to the image, the inspector, and touch this, and click on it. And there's that. And we can see what styles it has. It's got some styles from the main content. It's got its own inline style. It's got a style from the container, and it's got styles from the body. Notice this one. The text align center has been crossed off because that was overridden by this one that's in the container. So we can see the hierarchy, and that can come in very handy for debugging your own pages, uh, troubleshooting the HTML and the CSS, trying to figure out what's causing this to align the way it's aligned. Another cool feature, I'm going to go back to selecting uh, that title bar up at the top there, is that you can actually turn some of these things off. If you come over here, notice as I touch the styles, I get a little off button, as they call it, and I can turn that feature off temporarily just to see what happens. And notice now the background of my title bar is white, except for this, which is an image with a background. All right, so that's changed, and it's gone back to white now. And you can actually turn these things off. It doesn't change your HTML. Obviously, you're not going to be allowed to change the HTML on my website. But you can see what it would look like if I didn't have that feature installed. Maybe this is the one that's causing you trouble. I doubt it. It's background color. I could change the height and turn that off, so now no height is designated. That didn't have much of an effect. Right. When I turn those all back in there, then everything comes back to normal. Right. And so this is just a one small feature that allows you to inspect other people's sites to see how things are done. But it also allows you to inspect your own pages to see and try to troubleshoot why certain things are not lining up the way you want. One other feature I do want to mention is that my web page ha has a link to a to styles in another website in another location so if i go to the head here i can see that there is a link to the instructor mstc instructor includes folder which is a common folder that makes all of our pages supposedly look the same so if you wanted to find out what causes this bar this is actually an unordered list what causes it to not wrap we could click on them or actually back backspace here use the image inspector or the element inspector, click on that bar, okay, and there's my nav list. Now you might walk through this and you'll see that the unordered list has no pictures, it's un but notice that nav container, let's go to the nav bar, nothing here says make, make them go sideways. So what's causing that? Well, as it turns out, that does what doesn't get included here is external styles from another site. So if I want to see what's causing that, then I have to dig a little deeper, go back into the head. Here's that link. If I expand that, it now shows me all the styles that are on that site. Most of yours, your pages, in this class at least, are not going to be stealing styles from some other location. Okay. But if you wanted to notice that from other sites and steal their information, here's my list type equals none. But here's what causes them to go sideways. It's the display inline that causes the nav container list items to display across like that. Those are list items. Right. So if you want to steal or, or learn how things are done, you can open up the site, open up Firebug, and look around and get a feel for how that site was laid out. What I'm more interested in showing you for this course in particular, and by the way, to close the Firebug, just click the bug again and it goes away. All the panels are still lit up. This bug, if I disable all the panels, you would think the bug would go away, but it doesn't. That's how you think is an error right now in the current fire bug, is that once I disable all the panels, it says that my net panel is still enabled. If I go look, 
click on the net panel, it says it's disabled. So there's a bug in there that keeps that bug from turning off. I did find that if you close Firefox with all the panels disabled and then open up again with the same website, then Firefox bug will be completely grayed out again. All right, now he's grayed out. So there's a little bug in there right now, but they'll probably get that ironed out one of these days. What I now want to do is show you how to use Firebug to manage or to help you debug JavaScript, kind of things that you can do. So I'm going to try to resize my windows here. Actually, I might just leave. No, I'm going to resize that, make it about this size. And then I'm going to bring in a piece of uh, HTML that has JavaScript in it as well. So here's some JavaScript. Some of this we may not have talked about. First of all, it brings in my Voker tools. Let me bring up the folder for that file so that you can see what that looks like inside. Okay, so here's the folder. It's got images. This is a web form that we built in class. And I've added a Volker Tools folder that you can find on the iDrive that has some pre-built JavaScript. And just for demonstration purposes, I'm bringing in my format number JavaScript. Let's launch that page. Okay, so here's my form. And to get things started, let me just demonstrate how the JavaScript on this page works. This is basic validation. I'm going to close the Firebug window initially. I have some validation added to age. So if you leave it blank and you leave, a little error marker shows up, and when you touch it, it tells you what's wrong. If you put in text, it tells you what's wrong. It's not a valid number. If I put in a number that's too big, it tells me that's too big. And finally, if I put in something that's normal, then everything's cool and the marker goes away. So we haven't, in this year's class, 2011, we haven't even talked about this yet, but we will. But the key point here is how do I walk through the JavaScript to see what I want to see? Bring my Firebug back on again. All my panels are disabled, so I'm going to enable them again. Firebug recommends that when you're not using it to debug JavaScript or to analyze web pages that you turn off the bug so it doesn't slow down your browsing any. Uh, I think that's a pretty good idea. So now my panels are on, but when I loaded this page, the console wasn't enabled, the script page wasn't enabled, and so I need to refresh. And now all these tabs across the top are available to us. The console will allow you to see syntax errors. So in a second, I'm going, to, I'm going to, on purpose, put in a syntax error into my code. And then we'll see that it displays here so that we can fix it. The HTML tag we already looked at lets you look at the HTML of the page. Doesn't really help you in JavaScript debugging. Same thing for the CSS tab. It shows you the CSS that's in this page, but it doesn't help you in any debugging. But notice, again, the little markers are there so I can turn certain things off if I want to analyze what would happen. So these two we've already seen, but they don't help with JavaScript debugging. The script tag does have the JavaScript in it. It also has all the other HTML, but if I go find my JavaScript, and here's most of it, and we'll look at that in Notepad here in just a second, here I can put in breakpoints and I can use the watch window to keep track of what's going on. We'll come back to this in a second. First, let's go back to the Notepad++ file to analyze the JavaScript. I bring in that one external file, the format number file, and then on window load, I create an event handler. We haven't, we're getting ready to talk about these in class, but this is an event handler. What this says is whenever I leave text age, call this function. Right, so this function handles the on blur event. On blur is basically lost focus in VB. When we leave a field, on blur kicks in. This is a function that I've written. I like to keep all my functions down at the bottom out of the way. So here's the function. It's not terribly complex. So let's just take a quick look at it. De declares a variable called age. Remember in JavaScript, all variables are untyped. Declares a pointer to the text error marker. There is a marker. If I go look at the form here real quick, there is a marker. Right, and here's my age. And at the end of that, I have attached an image that is just a little error marker. 
size 14 by 14. Right. And initially, it's hidden. So until you type something in that box and this event occurs, that icon doesn't do anything. So I make a pointer to that icon to make it a little easier to change the way the icon appears, to make it visible, to add its title, and so on. Then I take what's in the text box, try to parse it, stick it into age. If parse fails, we don't get an error message. We just get is not a number basically stored in age. Now I'm going to do the validation. If the contents of the text box is the empty string, I can't test age because if it's empty, it'll show up as not a number. So I test the text box again, see if it's the empty string. If it is, I make the error marker visible and change its title. That's what happens when you rest on that icon to age as a required field. So this makes the icon visible and changes the text. If it's not blank, then if it's not a number, N-A-N, then I again make it visible and designate it's not a number. If it is a number and it's out of range, same thing. Finally, if it is a number and it's in range, then I hide the marker. And just to be safe, in case the user typed a decimal point, that is a number, and I don't want any, right, I'm going to format the number for as a number with no decimal places. Format number does that. It's very similar to the way VB works formatting numbers. If you actually go into that JavaScript, you can see some documentation at the top for how it works. But if the user enters any digits, decimal digits in, this strips them out, but doesn't cause an error. So that's a quick overview of what the code does. So now let's invoke some syntax errors here. First thing I'm going to do is misspell. Well, let's do it a little more subtly. And instead of parse int, we'll use parse integer. If I save that and go back to my page, press F5, and go to the console, nothing's happening because I haven't invoked that code yet. When you have code in a function that has an error, the function errors don't show up until you actually invoke that function. So I'm going to go into the age box, and I'm going to lose focus. I'm going to blur. As soon as I blur, my error message shows up. Notice the little bug up here also has a little number on them. You can actually turn those numbers off if you want to, but that's not bad. But here in the console is where your syntax errors are going to show up. So it'll tell you what the error is. Parse integer is not defined, and it'll show you the line that it's on. If you click on it, it'll take you into the HTML where it is, but it obviously is not going to take you to your notepad++. So I'm going back to the console, so I'm going to go fix that. And then if I go back to the, save that, if I go back to the page and refresh, the error's gone. But again, I haven't left here, so now I'm going to leave. My error marker shows up, but there's no syntax errors. Another thing to recognize is sometimes syntax errors can be hidden for a while. So I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to misspell visibility. Save that. But notice this is only, this line of code is only executed if I put in some text that is not blank. So this error is not going to show up until I hit this piece of code. So we'll save that, refresh the page. And if I type in a valid number, I don't get any errors. Everything's cool. But if I come in here and I leave it blank, I get my error marker, but no syntax errors. It's not until I hit that piece of code, which is typing in text that is not blank, I got my error marker. How come I didn't get my syntax error? Well, that's not what I expected. Did I save it? Yes, I did. I refreshed the form. Let's try it one more time. No syntax errors. That's what I get for picking a new error. What did I do? I misspelled visibility. Where did I misspell it? Visibility right there. It should have told me that that is not a style, but maybe it doesn't know that. Let's take it back a level and take one of the e, the R's out of pointer error. Save that. F5 to refresh. Type in my name, and there I got that error. So it looks like when we get out to this far, Java doesn't know that this misspelling, so that's interesting. You can actually type stuff in and it doesn't know that that's not a style that it recognizes. It's not part of the list, I guess. Right, so PTR error is not defined. Shows me which line. If I pull this back onto the screen. We see the line number as well. It's on line 199, and sure enough, it is. 
so I can fix that. Let me experiment. What happens if I misspell style? I'm guessing that's going to pop up. That one did. Style is undefined, but it didn't mind visibility. So after style, it seems, I didn't know that, seems to not know what styles are available. Let me take that to one more level. I'm just going to make its style visible. Save. Refresh. And then it's okay. So it seems like after that first decimal place, JavaScript can't figure out that there's something wrong. So if you're not getting errors and it's still not working, notice my error marker didn't show up. Okay. At this point, probably want to use breakpoints to try to figure out what's going on. But most of your syntax errors will show up in the console. Another thing you can do with the console is actually display messages. Like in VB, we had debug.writeline that would display messages down in the console, but not on your page to help you with troubleshooting. So let me do a couple of examples. The console is a predefined object, a global object as they call it in JavaScript, and it has the ability to enter information into a log, which basically prints down in that console window. In the parentheses, you can display or you can include whatever you want. So in my case, I'm going to include the word txt age followed by whatever's in txt age. First one's a label. Second one is the value that's in the text box. It lets my debugger show me what it found in that text box to make sure everything's cool. Then I might want to also take a look with another log entry of what happened after I try to convert it. And here I'll just put age, comma, in my variable called age. Even though they're console commands, they still need semicolons. Right, so let's see how those work. We'll save them. Refresh. And now when I leave, I'm going to leave it blank. Down in my console, I get text age is blank. You can't see it, but the age variable is NAN, which is not a number. So that's what's inside there. If I put in my name, it makes a new console entry is Boker, still not a number. If you don't like all this cluttering things up, you can click on clear, and it'll clear them out. So now I'll put in a number with decimal places and see that that's what's in there. Here's the 53. Notice that the decimal place has been removed. That was done by this statement down here that formats it with no decimal places. So the console can show you what's happening in your program as it runs. Every time I click on this and put in a new number, I get a new console and I can see this can help you debug as well just like it did in VB to let you see what your program is doing. And what's nice is if you put in bad values like text, it shows you what value gets stored after parse int is done. So those are pretty good. What you can also do, this is kind of interesting, is at the end you can do another console command called assert. Assert allows you to put in a condition that the PTR error.style.visibility is double equal to, because I'm doing comparison now, hidden. If this is false, you can display a message. Any message you want, and that'll show up. So you can use an assert that only shows, only logs stuff in the console if a certain condition is false. If the condition is true, this is skipped. If the condition is false, you get this error message. Save that. Refresh. I'll put in a valid number. And then see down here, we don't get that assert message. But if I put in Volker, then text age is Volker. It's not a number. And I get this red box saying my assert statement. Basically, this is the statement that showed up. And there's my message. Okay, I can click on it and see what function I was in. And that's another way that you can, only under certain circumstances, have error messages show up in your console.
All right, so those demonstrate those. I'm just going to comment them out so that you can see them. I will save this. Actually, I'm not going to save this, so I don't need to comment them out. You can steal that by pausing the recording. You can also read the contents of the book. Hopefully, you saw these in other places. So the console logs are another way that you can debug your program if there's any issues. You can have JavaScript display for you in the Firebug console the information that you're interested in try to figure out why your program's not working. The last thing we can do, and this is probably the most common, particularly for uh, logic errors. So if I were, for instance, to mistype this and include an equal sign, if the age is greater than or equal to 100, I could test my program, put in 100, I'd be getting an error message. So let's try that real quick, save it. Took all the console messages out, so I'm going to clear them, and reset the form. And now 100 should be legal. That's what I hope. 0 to 100 is legit, but when I click on it and leave, I get age must be between 0 and 100, and it is. So why am I getting an error? Well, what we can do is come down to the script and find our JavaScript, and it's down here. And we could put breakpoints and things on the little JavaScript that I have at the top, but most of my JavaScript's down near the bottom. Here we go. Let's say that when I get here, I want to look around and see what happens. So set a breakpoint just like you do in any other language. Point to the blank spot over here, add a breakpoint. Then I need to come back up here, and to re-invoke the validate age, I need to blur one more time. And now I have blurred, and just like in all the other programs, the yellow arrow is the next line to be executed. So this line has not been executed yet, but the watch window shows me that age has 100 in it. Okay. So that looks pretty good. That's what I expected. So I've already seen something there. And now I can use these buttons to walk through my code. When you were in VB, you learned about the different ways to walk through your code. You can go into a function. So we, we'll see that in a minute. We can skip over. This is what you normally do unless you have a function call that you want to jump into. If you accidentally jump into a function, you want to jump out, this steps back out again. This says run and quit breaking. And this says start over again. Right. So I want to step over and see what my program is doing. Step over. Skips down to the else, analyzes to see if it's an age. It is. So then it comes down here, and now I expect it to go in the. I expect it to skip over that and jump to the else, but it doesn't. It steps into. So that's my clue that there's probably something wrong with this else statement, this else if statement. And I should analyze it, and I say, up oh, there's the equal sign. So then I come back over here, take the equal sign out, and then my program will obviously work again. recording. Yeah. So that solves one error. Let's make another very common error, and that's when I'm doing my comparison. Instead of a double equal sign, I do an equal sign. Right. And what that says, realistically, is that when you hit this if statement, assign the empty string to the text age box. Now that could be annoying, so let's save that. Refresh the page. And when I type in 100 and leave, I get my breakpoint. I didn't want that, so I'm going to take the breakpoint out and run. What I expect is this is going to get wiped out. No, it didn't. So it didn't do quite what I wanted to, and the 100 is, does seem to be acceptable. So let's see, maybe this error wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be. Let's put in invoker. I get an error message, but it wiped it out. Okay, so at least I got my error message saying that's not a valid number. Now let's put in the 100. And I'm really surprised it's not wiping that out. Because my code says when you hit this statement, and we hit it every single time, take the empty string and put it in the text age.value. That should be changing the text box. I'm surprised it's not. But again, when we made an error, it did wipe it out. And that's not what we want. We want the user to be able to see what they typed and made a mistake on and even the 100. So it looks like it's wiping it out whenever I make an error, which is interesting. 
and it could be this statement down here that's doing that. Oh, this statement is what leaves it. No, it should only hit this if everything's good. All right, so that's what happened. This wiped it out, but then if everything's okay, if age is okay, then it comes back down here and puts the age back in there, so that's why. All right, so I could actually debug that. Let's do it and see how that's working, because it's not doing what I expect. So I put my breakpoint back put in the 100 and come back in here. Okay. At this point, age is 100, okay, but what we can't see is what's in text age. Maybe we can look around a little bit here. But now we can watch what's happening. We put in 100, so we would expect this if statement to be false if the text box is equal to the empty string. It's not, so I would expect it to skip over that, but it doesn't. I pressed F10. I'm going to get some focus here. Uh oh. Just continue, and let's step over. For some reason, Firefox locked up on me here. Let's refresh the page. All right. Now, let's put in the 100. My breakpoint is still in there when I leave. Comes down here. Now I want to step over, and I expect it to skip this if statement. And it did because this ended up being false because it's the empty string. The empty string is treated as zero, so this becomes a false in this value is a zero. It's kind of complicated, but it's false. All these are going to be false. If I had set this to anything else, it would be true. The empty string is zero. Any other value is one or more, so it would be true. What it's really analyzing is this. But anyway, so everything's working okay, but now I'll look at age is still pretty good. Step over, step over, and I'm inside here. Right. Now, can I touch the text age value and find out what's in there? No. So this might be a good place for a log. My debugger is not helping me much. But that's a very subtle error, and you can see how difficult it is to find because we don't see what's in text age. So let me stop this. And before I get down here, I want to see what's in text age. Why is it wiping? Where is it wiping stuff out? So before it gets in here, I want to see what's in text age. I could put a console command here, and I think I will. Console.log, i going to spell it right. Followed by my dollar sign. Okay, and I already know what's wrong, so I'm kind of, now I'm going to come down here. I know it's making it there because I used my debugger. Now, it's not indented properly, but who cares? We're going to wipe it out anyways. All right, save that. Now, F5. And as I put in an age of 100 and 1, because it's going to wipe it out, okay. come in here. And in my console right now, it doesn't tell me anything. I haven't gotten that far yet. I'm on the console command. So I'm just going to hit run this time. I'm not going to worry about the breakpoint. Turn the breakpoint off and hit run. And then my console tells me that text age is 101. And that I never got in here. Why is text age 101? It was up here. But I never got in here. All right, so now what's text age? pull it underneath. And you can see there's not always a clean, exact way to try and debug these things. So I'm going to save that. didn't tell me what I wanted to know. Again, type in 101, and now it says text age is blank. So somewhere in this if statement, my text age got changed. I never made it in here. I know that. So this is the only, oh, and then I see the single equal sign. And maybe I'll fix it. The other alternative is if it's bad, we could try to find out what's going on with the log as well. But the log has verified for me that text age is getting wiped out, but I could see that on the form. What I don't see is where, and I don't have a real good way of finding out what's in this value using the debugger. Let me see if I can figure out a way to do that. So if I go back to the script, let's put a breakpoint down here one more time, 
you know, this doesn't work, then we'll have to use the log, which is part of the tool set. I want to see what's in text age, and I wonder if there's some way I can get to it over here. So one more time, we refresh the page, put in 101, good enough. Now I get here, I can see the 1001, but what I can't see anywhere in here by the looks of it is what's in text input age, what's in there. That's where it's coming from, but can I see its value? Let's see if I can expand that. It doesn't seem to want to, it's thinking about it. Thinking about it. Thinking really hard. Here's this still not showing me anything, but it's still thinking as well. This is causing errors. There it goes. There's, do I see the value here someplace? Probably way down. See, the reason it took so long is because there's so many things that we could look at. But here's its value. It's still 1,001 at this point. Okay, so if I then step over. Now is it thinking about that? Must be. Now this is running off an iDrive location, so maybe that's keeping it slow. Pause the recording while it's thinking. Well, I don't know if this is because it's off the hard drive, but I've stepped twice, and it took quite a little while. But now I can see, there's the this, if I scroll down to the value, that at this point, the value is empty. So I was on this line. I've just stepped over that line. And now all of a sudden, it's empty. Before it, right up here, and even when I was on that line, remember, that's the next line to be executed, the value was still 1,001. But now, all of a sudden, it's blank, so something between here and here wiped it out. But it seems that when we use this and it's expanded, that debugging really slows down. So I'm going to collapse that and hope that it speeds back up again. But those are the different kinds of tools that you can use to try to figure out what's going on in your program. You can use the console to display messages in the console, and you can then use the debugger and the script tab, script tag, excuse me, to step through your code and use watches to see what's going on. One other thing to mention, I have brought in uh, JavaScript from my uh, external Volker tools files. If they're included on the page, you can see them. Initially, you see the JavaScript that's on your form. But if you want to, you can drop this down and notice there's format number, and you can debug through this as well and see the code, though you could steal, steal the code anytime. All right. But if you need to, you can walk through this. But most of the time, especially my Volker tools, they've been thoroughly tested. They should be OK. But if it's your own stuff that you're bringing in from an external file, you can walk through that as well and set breakpoints in here, et cetera. So that's a quick overview of Firebug and how it can help you debug JavaScript. Practice makes perfect. Keep at it.